All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, so my name is Natalie and I work in the marketing department here at Rothman. Um, again, thank you for joining us and I hope everyone is doing well. Just a reminder to please keep yourself on mute so that there aren't any distractions during the presentation. We will re be recording the lecture as you may have just heard um, and I will email it to everybody after tonight so that you can have it for future reference. Also, if you have any questions during, please type them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen and Dr. Lahner can answer them at the end. I will send a message in there when we begin so that you can see where it is and it will blink at the bottom of the screen. So tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Jess Lahner and just a little bit about him. Dr. Lahner is a board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in the surgical treatment of knee arthritis and meniscus tears. For over 20 years, he has been a leader in the fields of partial and total knee replacement surgery. He was one of the first surgeons in the United States to use robotic methods for knee replacement surgery, having introduced robotic techniques to the greater Philadelphia region in 2008. Dr. Lahner sees patients in Bryn Mawr, King of Prussia, and our South Philadelphia offices. And Dr. Lahner, if you wanna take it from here. Great, well, thank you, Natalie. Uh, hello, everyone, and um, thank you for sharing a part of your evening with me. And Natalie, I can see you. Please wait, nod your head if you can, you can hear me. Okay, perfect. I've been having some, some uh, audio issues with my computer. But thank you all for chiming in tonight. It's always a, a real treat to speak with patients about some of the work that we're doing in knee replacement surgery. As Natalie mentioned, I've been practicing as a knee surgeon for over 20 years. And it's amazing when I think back uh, two decades ago when I gave a lecture to a small community group at a local library, the talk that I gave was so utterly different than the talk that I'm gonna give you tonight. And I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some of the new strategies that we're using around knee replacement surgery, uh, some of the the new uh, interesting concepts in robotic surgery, and the notion that, that not everyone actually needs a total knee replacement, but in fact, many people are candidates for some crazy outlandish procedure called a partial knee replacement, which some of you I'm sure have heard of, others of you have never heard of it, so I'm happy to discuss a little bit about partial knee replacements tonight. As a little bit of a, as a disclaimer, I will, I will caution you that if any of you have seen me in my office uh, and we talked about surgery, if I didn't mention partial knee replacements to you, it probably means that you were not a candidate. So uh, don't be offended or alarmed. Um, I promise you, uh, if I had thought you were a candidate, I would have talked about it with you. Uh, but without further ado, let's... Uh, talk about what's new and what's interesting in knee replacement surgery in 2020. So if you're here because you're suffering with knee arthritis, you're certainly not alone. This is a very common problem. And in fact, the knee is the most common joint affected by arthritis. There are more than 18 million people who come in every year for evaluation of their arthritic knee. Um, and what does arthritis look like? Many of us think we might know what it is, but uh, what I have found is that the, the, the best way of describing what arthritis is, is if we take you into the evening uh, kitchen uh, and imagine you're holding up a chicken bone and recognize that at the end of a chicken bone, there's this pearly white cap. That pearly white cap is actually cartilage. And if the chicken had arthritis, what you would see are a lot of craters and uh, cracks and, um, and, and rough surfaces on that cartilage. And in fact, the cartilage would no longer look smooth and pearly, but it would start to look kind of like the craters of the moon. And that creates uh, the aches and the pains and the crackling sensations that many of you describe when you come into the office complaining of knee arthritis. Well, what about the x-rays? So on the left here, you have a normal set of x-rays. You can see the thigh bone on top that's called the femur. 
and the two shin bones. The bigger one is called the tibia, and the smaller one is called the fibula. Now, the space between those bones is actually not filled with air. It's filled with cartilage, and the cartilage has a certain thickness. In the healthiest of us, that cartilage cap is maybe around a quarter inch, probably a little less. But as the cartilage starts to wear thin and starts to break down, the bones of the knee start to get closer and closer and closer together. And in the worst stages of arthritis, such as the one that you see here on the right, the bones begin to touch. Now, in the most extreme case like this one, the bones can also become misaligned so that they're no longer aligned one on top of the other. And that, that's related to instability and probably some failure of various ligaments around the knee. Now, of course, those of you on the phone, I'm sure primarily are suffering with pain because that's probably the most common symptom that, that brings patients into the office. But there's a cohort of patients who are actually blessed with a remarkably high pain tolerance. And those patients don't necessarily feel pain with activities, but rather when they do certain activities, they tend to fatigue or their knee tends to fatigue. And I consider that a pain equivalent. Um, patients will often also complain of stiffness and many patients do lose quite a bit of range of motion of their knees. Uh, they can feel crackling and grinding with certain activities. And most patients will start to develop some level of deformity. So the most common deformity in knee arthritis uh, is, is a bowed leg where the outer part of the knee extends a little bit outward, such as in this uh, photograph of a patient. Uh, this, this bowed leg is the most common pattern of, of deformity that we see. About 10% of patients will have a knee that bows in the other direction. That's called knock knee. So there's sort of a bowed leg deformity and a knock knee deformity, both which are commonplace in knee arthritis. And then of course, because of the arthritis and the irritation of the joint surfaces, many people will have swelling. Oftentimes the swelling comes and goes. Uh, sometimes it stays around permanently, but often too that contributes to some of the discomfort that people have when they're dealing with arthritis. So what are the options for treating arthritis? Tonight's talk will focus mostly on the surgical techniques, but many patients, the majority of patients, have either mild or moderate arthritis for which they don't need surgery, or they might have advanced arthritis but are really not interested in, in knee replacement surgery. So there are a variety of things that we can entertain short of doing surgery. First and foremost, if a patient is, is overweight, that puts a lot of stress and strain on the cartilage surfaces of the knee. So we tend to get our patients involved in weight reduction programs, either through their primary care doctor's offices, or we, we work with several nutritionists who can help with the process. And if, if you lose five pounds or 10 pounds, uh, there's a dramatic reduction of stress and strain on the knee joints. And even just a few pounds can have a significant benefit uh, to the pain and suffering that many of you suffer. Um, activity modification is another one. So if you can walk two blocks, but if you walk three blocks, the knee starts to hurt, then what we tend to do is recommend you limit yourself to just walking the amount that you can tolerate. Um, obviously you have to individualize the recommendation based on what patients typically do and what they respond to. And there's no cookbook uh, recommendation for every patient. We tend to, to re make recommendations based on the context of what our patients tell us. Using a cane or using crutches or a walker can help offload the joint, particularly in more extreme cases of arthritis. Bracing may or may not be something to consider. We often recommend these uh, rather flimsy neoprene or elastic braces, which oftentimes uh, help by keeping the knee compressed. Uh, I personally think those braces work best in the colder winter months to keep the knee warm and take some of the, the cold ache away from the knee. There are also more rigid braces that we sometimes use called unloader braces or offloader braces that can help shift the weight if the arthritis is, is localized to one part of the knee 
we can use a brace that shifts the weight away from that arthritic compartment to try to offload that area. And then of course, there are a variety of medicines like Tylenol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, a supervised exercise program, um, either with or without a physical therapist can be quite helpful, particularly for patients who are a little bit deconditioned. If your muscle strength is not great, strengthening the muscles and improving uh, your gait can be very helpful when you're dealing with knee arthritis. We have several injections that we often use, either cortisone, which is a steroid, or these other injections. Many of you come in asking about those gel injections. Uh, they're all often referred to as viscosupplement injections, and they're composed with something called hyaluronic acid, which is actually the native uh, uh, component of joint fluid. And for some patients, those injections can be helpful. Unfortunately, all of these injections, uh, all of these treatments rather, are most effective earlier in the stage of arthritis. As the arthritis gets worse, the benefit of those treatments become less and less. Stem cells and PRP, quite honestly, are, are um, not very helpful uh, for the treatment of knee arthritis. There are some doctors and some practices who give those, but they're less effective for the treatment of knee arthritis, particularly end-stage arthritis, than other interventions. Well, what's the typical surgical approach to knee arthritis? Historically, throughout the greater Philadelphia region and across the world, the majority of, of surgeons would offer patients total knee replacement surgery. And that's certainly what most of you have heard about. Well, what is a total knee replacement? Intuitively, a lot of our patients, it turns out, think that when we mention a total knee replacement, we're actually whacking off the entire knee and then replacing it with some big block of, of metal. But actually, it's a little more refined than that. What we do is we make a, an incision into the knee and then we uh, resect very carefully uh, the surfaces of the knee joints which are degenerated. And then we cap the ends of the bones with metal and plastic surfaces. So really a better term for a total knee replacement is a metallic uh, resurfacing procedure. The fact of the matter is though, is that the term total knee replacement surgery has been around since the 1970s when the procedure was first developed and that's what we're kind of stuck with. Um, the, the cap on the end of the femur bone is typically made out of cobalt chrome. There are some alternative um, surfaces that we might use if a patient tells us that they have an allergy to nickel or costume jewelry. There are some ceramic type uh, surfaces that we can use. And the top and the component that goes on the top of the tibia bone, the shin bone, is typically made out of a combination of titanium and plastic. Uh, occasionally, an alternative uh, tray will be used that's not made out of titanium, but something else. And then in 30% of knees, we put a plastic button on the back surface of the patella, the kneecap. We don't have to replace all patellae, all kneecaps, because it turns out that 70% of the time, uh, the kneecap is very healthy, and there's good rational explanation for not routinely resurfacing it. Well, let's talk a little bit have, about how things have changed in total knees. I mentioned that 23 years ago when I was giving these talks, uh, it, the, the content of the talk was very different than it is now. First and foremost, the demographics of our patients have changed. It used to be uh, 20 some odd years ago that the average age of our patients was about 78 years old, those who were coming in for total knees. About 10 years ago, the average age of our patients was about 73. And now our patients on average are 65 years old. Our patients are becoming, um, they're coming in at a younger age, uh, they're typically more active and more demanding with greater expectations for what the knee replacements may allow them to do afterwards. And the good news is that for those of you who are at a time in your lives where you're considering knee replacement surgery, the reality is that our total knees now are made extremely well. They're far more durable uh, 
in patients than they were 20 years ago, even in highly active patients. So we certainly have a lot of faith in our total knee replacements, even in our young and active patients. One of the more impressive developments over the last 10 years, certainly, has been our rapid recovery protocols and our improved pain management uh, that allow our patients to recover more quickly and with, with far less pain than in years past, and I'll touch on those uh, details in a little bit. Our patients are often uh, discharged either the day of surgery or a day or two after the total knee replacement surgery, depending on their circumstances and their progress. And while 20 years ago, roughly 85% of our patients would go to a skilled nursing facility or an acute rehab facility after total knee replacements, now in 2020, at least in our practice, less than 5% uh, of our patients go to an acute rehab or skilled nursing facility after total knee replacement surgery. And most of the patients who end up going to those facilities are people who have uh, who undergo bilateral total knee replacement surgery. In other words, we replace both the right and the left knees at the same uh, hospital setting when uh, the rehab is a little bit more difficult. And then we're increasingly using orthopedic specialty facilities where we only do orthopedics, and there's some real benefit to those types of facilities. And as Natalie mentioned, a real interest of mine over the last 12 to 13 years has been the use of robotic technologies for our partial knees uh, and, and uh, more recently total knees and even total hips. Uh, and I'm happy to share some of my thoughts about robotic technology as well. I mentioned that our patients are changing. Um, there are also a lot of patients who have total knee replacements. 25 years ago when I was uh, in the latter stages of training, uh, there were approximately 250,000 total knee replacements performed in the United States every year. Now that number is 700,000 total knee replacements. It's a huge number of patients. On, on any given day, there's somewhere between four and a half and five million people walking around in the United States with total knee replacements. So it's a, a very common problem. I often tell my patients who are tennis players and golfers, when they go on the golf course or the tennis court with a pair of shorts, they can probably um, pick out at least half a dozen other people who have had their knees replaced. I mentioned that uh, the average age of our patients is now 65 years old. And actually in my practice and many practices like mine, actually the fastest growing group of people coming in for total knee replacements or partial knee replacements are those who are 55 years old and younger. So like I said, this, is, this has uh, been a procedure that we've really been able to uh, extend to a larger cohort of people throughout the country. Now, we all have heard the horror stories of, of narcotic uh, consumption and the problems associated with that. And I'm really happy to say that throughout the or medical community in general, but particularly uh, in my little world of orthopedics, the orthopedic community has been making great strides in managing surgical pain uh, by minimizing the use of narcotic medications. And that is the most important contribution of our orthopedic community in the last 25 years since I've been in practice. This is a really important consideration. And the way we've done this is first we've made a point of counseling patients who are on narcotics preoperatively about the need to get off those medicines and to work with their pain management doctors or their primary care doctors to look for alternative uh, ways of managing their arthritis pain. If a patient comes in and they're on narcotics for arthritis, it becomes very difficult to manage that pain after surgery. We really try to work hard with our patients uh, who are in need of a, of a weaning off process prior to surgery. And then we have a variety of strategies that we use during and after the surgery to help reduce surgical pain. Certainly our surgical techniques have changed over the last decade or two. Uh, our surgeries are a little bit less invasive. 
we uh, impart less trauma to the soft tissues around the knee. And that in and of itself creates a little less pain. We also inject a long acting Novocaine to the nerves around the knee. And those can provide typically between six and 16 hours of highly significant pain relief after the surgical procedure. Uh, we like to use ice a lot. Uh, ice has to be used carefully because if you put ice on the skin directly for an extended period of time, you can actually get frostbite. And I've seen that happen and it's not a, a pretty sight. But we use cooling packs that are very effective. And then we use a cocktail of non-narcotic medicines that include things like meloxicam or Mobic, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicine, and Tylenol, another medicine called Neurontin, which attacks pain at the nerve level, uh, and other medicines that help control the pain. And we have patients take those medicines on a schedule. That thereby reduces the need for Percocet or some other opioid type medication. Um, but we also give those medicines as needed. Um, we found though, through various studies, that by using this cocktail of medicines, we've been able to significantly re reduce the uh, need for Percocet or other opioids. Someone may have their phone on. If you can mute that, that's great. We're getting a little background scatter. Thank you. Uh, I also want to shout out um, to uh, my colleagues and partners at the Rothman Institute who are spearheading the Rothman Foundation for Opioid Research and Education. And through this foundation, we're doing a lot of research, not just in joint replacements, but in other specialties and subspecialties as well, to come up with better techniques of managing pain better surgical procedures to reduce pain, um, alternatives to opioids, uh, and better educational methods of, of informing patients about the risks of opiates. And I'd encourage you to go onto our website and take a look at, at the site uh, that, drills with, that deals with opioid research and education. I think you'll find it very insightful. The other thing that's changed quite a bit is the role of physical therapy in, in total knee replacement surgery. Historically, we believe that aggressive physical therapy by a physical therapist with their supervision, starting immediately after surgery upon discharge, was absolutely critical. And what we found when we really paid attention to those patients is that obviously therapy was important exercising after knee replacement surgery is critical, but we had a large number of patients who for one reason or another didn't go to formal physical therapy, but they were dedicated and disciplined about doing their exercises on their own. And what we found anecdotally is that the patients who were going for physical therapy, typically on the night of therapy and the day after, would have these incredible flares of pain where the knee really felt much more painful. Oftentimes there's some swelling associated with that. Whereas the other patients who were disciplined about doing exercises on their own, but they did it on their own, they didn't have those spikes of pain uh, that our other patients have. And we've now done several prospective randomized trials, both in total knees and partial knees, where we have found that for those patients who are inclined, um, to do their exercises every day, two or three times a day after knee replacement surgery, we can get equivalent outcomes in terms of recovery of motion, recovery of function, and return to activities of daily living with a significant cost savings compared to those patients who go to see a physical therapist two or three times a week. So it's a consideration. Turns out that about 30% of our patients choose to do exercises on their own, either with a web-based physical therapy platform uh, or just using a simple paper handout showing some uh, simple exercises. I mentioned a little earlier that uh, the location of care has changed too. 
while we at the Rothman Institute are honored and lucky to be working uh, as a partner with some really top tiered general hospitals. Um, we also have access to some orthopedic specialty hospitals uh, and surgery centers where all we do is orthopedics. And particularly over the last nine months, uh, when things began opening up, having these COVID free environments uh, was quite important for us and for our patients. Uh, and even today, we um, follow strict protocols where patients are tested 20, uh, 48 hours or 72 hours before surgery, then they quarantine before coming into these facilities. Um, even before COVID, uh, the opportunity to do knee replacement surgery in, in environments where we don't have the general medical population uh, in the hospital uh, was an advantage. Obviously, there's bacteria that can um, be in hospitals, and keeping patients in an orthopedic specialty hospital uh, can be a real benefit. Unfortunately, not all of our patients are candidates for surgery in these facilities. Um, but about 50% of our patients are. It depends a little bit uh, on your health profile, um, and it depends on your insurance carrier. It turns out that the insurance carriers actually like these facilities because we've been able to show that we can deliver care um, at a fraction of the cost compared to uh, how we deliver care at the general hospitals. Uh, so these environments are safe, they're affordable, uh, and it turns out they get amongst the highest patient satisfaction scores in the country. And we're really proud of the, the high quality nursing care, nurse practitioner care, physician uh, extender care at these facilities. And as I mentioned, many of our patients, the majority of our patients go home either the day of surgery or the next day, depending on how they're progressing. Well, what are the outcomes after total knee replacement surgery? This is a highly successful procedure. And um, we have found that um, um, after decades of studying total knee replacements and comparing the outcomes of total knees to other procedures that we think are extremely important uh, interventions, Turns out that, that total knee replacement surgery is one of the most impactful medical procedures in terms of improving the quality of, of a patient's life. And so it's really a thrill for those of us who do this to see how well the majority of patients do. 94% of patients have significant pain relief and significant functional improvement. Uh, and nowadays, over 90% of total knee replacements will last roughly 20 years. So we're very pleased with uh, how well our patients are doing. Uh, and again, even uh, with our patients getting younger and younger, we still know that our patients uh, can have these replacements in for a very long time. Patient satisfaction though, is not necessarily as high as we'd want it to be. Several studies have shown that Approximately 80% of patients are satisfied after their total knee replacements, which means that 20% are not as satisfied as we'd like. And the reason they're not as satisfied is because for many patients, the recovery is a little bit longer uh, than they would have liked. Those numbers are changing a little bit as our pain protocols and recovery protocols have shifted. But still after full recovery, there are still some activity limita limitations. Some patients have some difficulty kneeling, for instance, or doing certain um, athletic or high-end activities. Uh, for some patients, their expectations are not met. And some pa patients, 6% uh, in some studies, 30% in other studies, will have some mild residual knee pain. Now, it's typically not an eight or nine or 10 out of, out of 10 pain, but it could be a one, two, or three out of 10 pain with certain activities. And I mentioned that 50% of people have difficulty kneeling after a total knee replacement. And it's not so much that it's painful to kneel, 
but for some patients, it just feels weird to kneel because there's an area of numbness just to the outer edge of the skin incision that occurs in pretty much all patients after any surgery in front of the knee. Well, there are different patterns of arthritis. In fact, there are three compartments to the knee, and certainly all of the compartments of the knee can be affected with arthritis, but many times only one part of the knee is infected with arthritis. And it turns out only 6% or so of patients have arthritis in all three compartments, and somewhere between 35 and 50% of patients that we see have arthritis in only one compartment of the knee. And that's an important consideration. You know, the dentist figured it out long ago. Most dentists would treat these two patients very diff differently. Patient on the bottom left who just lost one tooth but has otherwise healthy gums and healthy teeth could be treated with a, a bridge procedure. Uh, whereas the other patient may, may, may need a whole mouthful of, of teeth. And we finally have learned from our dental colleagues that we can actually do the same thing when it comes to knee replacement surgery. So if there's only one part of the knee that's in, affected by arthritis, we can do a partial knee, either a patellofemoral replacement, which is a replacement of the front of the knee, including the kneecap, or another procedure called a unicompartmental replacement, where we, we resurface the inner compartment or outer compartment of the knee joint. Um, that's actually the most common partial knee replacement that we do. And of course, total knee replacement surgery is the other option. And the choice of, of replacement depends on a variety of things. First, we have to assess the pattern of arthritis. Does the arthritis indeed only affect one compartment of the knee? Is there much deformity and are the ligaments stable? And is the knee reasonably flexible? Those three issues are very important because typically we do partial knee replacements when there's very little deformity, when there's good flexibility of the knee, good range of motion, and when the ligaments are stable. You could have arthritis that looks like it's in one compartment of the knee, but if the knee is extremely stiff, deformed, and unstable, then you'd be better off with the total knee. The other thing that we consider is the location of pain. So some patients have pain that's really diffuse throughout the entire knee, uh, and even though the arthritis may look localized, in those sorts of patients, it may be best to do a total knee replacement as well because of, of, of the um, difficulty in, in localizing the knee pain. In my practice, 30% of patients are candidates for partial knee replacement. The other 70% get total knees. Some patients come in, they're hopeful that they might be a candidate for a partial knee. They, will sometimes leave dejected when I tell them that they're better off getting a total knee. But I'm here to say that both procedures are very good. And like I mentioned earlier, our results have dramatically improved with total knee replacements. There are, however, several advantages to partial knee replacements compared to total knees. They uh, tend to recover more quickly with less pain. We don't typically give many blood transfusions anymore for total knee replacements. But historically, with the older techniques that we use, there was certainly a, a lower need for blood transfusions with partial knees than total knees. There are less medical risks, things like infections and blood clots and whatnot that can happen with all types of knee replacements happen less frequently with partial knees. Um, patients who get partial knees in my practice are typically sent home on the day of surgery whereas most of my patients who get total knee replacements are sent home the next day or two days later. Because of the fact that we can preserve the normal ligaments in the knee of a partial knee replacement, and we don't cut all the tissues in a, in a total knee, these knees tend to feel more normal than a total knee, which tends to feel a little bit more mechanical. And ultimately, when patients recover, they typically can get back to a higher level of function with more satisfaction and their expectations are more likely to be met with a partial knee than with a total knee. And we and others have looked at this, comparisons of the time to recovery of partial knees versus total knees. And it turns out that 
patients who get partial knees tend to recover about two thirds more quickly than patients who get total knee replacements. And the extent of recovery, the quality of recovery also differs between partial knees and total knees. So if you ask patients whether they can perform certain activities of daily living, uh, the answer is uh, more patients with partial knees can get back to high level of function than total knees. And partial knees are more likely to feel normal than a total knee. As I mentioned, total knees tend to feel a little bit more mechanical because of the fact that most of the, um, um, some of the ligaments in the joint are removed and the surfaces uh, of the knee are removed entirely. Whereas with a partial knee, we can be more selectively in how we resurface the joint surfaces. Well, we've looked at tens of thousands of patients over the years. And this is a study that we published a few years ago uh, where we looked at the incidence of 30-day complications after partial knees compared to total knees. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, some complications can occur uh, for all knee replacements. The good news though is that the incidence in general of all the complications have gone down, uh, both for total knees and partial knees. But the incidence of all the complications that we're fearful of, infections, blood clots, heart attacks, bleeding, pulmonary emboli, which is where a blood clot breaks off and goes to the lungs, extended hospitalization, rehospitalization, and death, the the uh, incidence of these complications after a partial knee are about two to three times reduced compared to the incidence of these complications in a total knee replacement. And what about patient satisfaction? I mentioned that in total knees, about 80% of patients are satisfied. Uh, there have been some studies that have looked at this in partial knees and have found that about 94% of patients are satisfied with their partial knee replacements. We've looked at this issue as well, and we found that with partial knees, again, there's a significantly shorter hospitalization, significantly greater improvement in function, and patients who get partial knees are more likely to have had their expectations met than patients getting total knees. We've also compared opioid uh, requirements and consumption after partial knees versus total knees. And I'm thrilled to say that while we've made tremendous advances in the need for narcotics in joint replacement in general, um, if you compare partial knees to total knees, the need for opioid medicines is far less, significantly less with a partial knee replacement than a total knee replacement. Well, what impacts the results and the durability of knee replacement surgery? Certainly we have, to pay, we have to select our patients well. We have to choose patients who have uh, legitimate amounts of arthritis causing their knee pain. Uh, there's data that shows that if you do a total knee replacement in someone who's got severe knee pain, um, but their arthritis isn't that severe, the results are typically uh, not very satisfactory for patients. There have also been studies that show that when total knee and partial knee replacement surgery are done in the hands of high volume, uh, high experience surgeons, the outcomes uh, are better and the avoidance of complications are better as well. And then the third real important element is the accuracy with which the component parts are implanted and the way that the soft tissues are balanced. We know that if a total knee or a partial knee replacement is performed well, if the components are aligned well and the soft tissues are balanced, the outcomes are better than if the components are not put in well and the knee's not balanced. And that brings me to our discussion on robotics for knee replacement. So I became interested in robotics in around 2006 and 2007. Uh, primarily for use in partial knees, because while I thought I was a skilled and talented surgeon, I knew there was always opportunity to become better. Uh, and we really uh, pushed the issue of robotics for partial knee replacements um, 
And there have been tremendous advances uh, over the last decade in terms of the types of robots that we use. We're now in what I would consider our third iteration or third generation of robotic technology. Uh, and I'm also happy to say that while there were just a, a small number of us for about five or seven years doing robotic surgery um, and, and presenting on our experience and publishing on our experiences, um, now there's a far uh, greater number of, of joint replacement surgeons using this technology for partial knees, but also now increasingly for total knee replacements and even hip replacements. And we developed robotics back in 2007, 2008, with the intention of improving the accuracy with which we prepared the bone for the implants. We uh, anticipated that this would help better align the components and allow us to, soft, to, to balance the soft tissues uh, with greater precision. And indeed, we have found that each of those has borne out. So yes, robotics have improved the accuracy of the surgery and have improved the soft tissue balancing. And now that we've been doing this long enough, uh, we have data that shows uh, that um, we are seeing improvements in clinical results and durability, particularly with partial knees, uh, while the accuracy has been enhanced with total knees and total hips, the, the data is less compelling in, t in terms of their uh, impact on functional outcomes and durability, except in a handful of, of um, series. But certainly with partial knees, we've shown these to be the case. I mentioned that there's been increased penetration and increased adoption of robotics over the last five to seven years. Um, now, uh, Approximately 29% of partial knee replacements are done with robotics, and 5% of total knees are done with robotics. Uh, but we anticipate that these numbers will continue to grow as the surgical techniques become more time efficient, as the price of the robots become more affordable for hospitals, uh, and as more and more surgeons become trained in the in the techniques of robotic surgery. A, a wise philosopher once said that we're all robots when uncritically involved with our technologies. So uh, since 2008, 2009, I've been uh, rigorously studying our outcomes and publishing and presenting on our outcomes. And I'll share a few with you tonight. Um, the interesting thing is that when we looked at the alignment of our components with an early generation robotic technology, we found that there was a significant and dramatic improvement in the accuracy and the reduction of, of error of component alignment. The interesting thing is that there have been several other studies performed with the initial robot that I had used back in starting in 2007, 2008. Um, and also uh, with newer robots, including some studies that uh, my group and I have done, what we have shown is that with the robot, we can reduce the error of positioning to two tenths of a degree, which is a remarkable reduction of error compared to conventional techniques where there's a broader range of, of variability in alignment. More recently, a number of us have found that when we compare the results of robotic knee replacement surgery um, compared to conventional techniques, the robotic techniques are improving early functional outcomes. And with regards to partial knee replacements, it appears that in patients who are highly active, there's some improvement in later outcomes as well. Again, in those patients who receive their partial knee with robotic technology. We have shown that patient expectations at one year are more likely to have been met with robotic assistance. And there have been several studies that have shown a lower failure rate uh, at five years in partial knees. Interestingly, in total knees, the literature from large volume centers has not necessarily supported that the robotic technology 
reduces um, failure rates at five or 10 years. Uh, but my sense is that even if we get equivalent results in total knees, the paradigm by which we do total knees is going to be forever changed with greater precision, greater efficiency, and an ability to quantify the balance of our joints. And ultimately, it's my firm belief that in the next five years, we're going to be able to pair artificial intelligence and machine learning with robotic technologies for helping us to position the components, to balance the soft tissues. Uh, and ultimately, we expect that that will have a more dramatic effect on functional outcomes and hopefully, hopefully durability as well. So in conclusion, uh, knee arthritis is very common. As I mentioned, there are, are millions of you walking around right now with bad knee arthritis, and many patients thankfully can be treated without surgery. But for those patients who are contemplating both total and partial knee replacement surgery, I'm happy to say that our protocols have helped to minimize the risk in terms of how we stratify patients according to their risk profile and medical history. We can do surgery with less pain and uh, with a reduction in the use of opioid medications. Our protocols are allowing our patients to recover more quickly um, and allowing them, our patients to go home rather than going to outpatient or inpatient rehab facilities. We also know that partial knee replacements may be an alternative for approximately 30% of our patients. Not, not all doctors do partial knee replacements, but for those of us who do uh, a large volume, about 30% of our patients are indeed candidates for partial knees. Partial knees allow our patients to re recover more rapidly. These knees feel more normal than a total knee replacement. There's less medical risk associated with the surgery improved satisfaction. And again, we can do the majority of these partial knees on an outpatient basis. And then of course, there's robotic assisted surgery, which we've shown uh, to improve the precision of the procedure, enhancing the orientation and alignment of the components, and balancing of the soft tissues. And we're seeing some optimization of outcomes and durability and robotic surgery certainly may be an option for you in those centers that offer it as an option. Of course, our greatest satisfaction comes from our patients. And when we develop a relationship with our patients. Thanks for my new knee, Jess. And they send us video vignettes or, or emails or letters telling us how they've gotten their lives back together. Um, it's, it's really a very satisfactory um, experience for us. Um, we're humbled by those of you who choose to have um, doctors in the Rothman Institute take care of you. Uh, it's always an honor to be able to provide care for those who are suffering with arthritis of the knee. And, um, I uh, hope to meet some of you in the future, and uh, good luck to those of you who are contemplating having your knees replaced. So I think at that point, um, we'll end the formal part of the presentation. Thanks, Dr. Lahner. And we do have quite a few questions in the chat box, so um, would you like me to read them and you answer, or do you want to just go and look at them? Well. Maybe I can have you, oh, I found it. I can read through some of these questions. Okay. Um, what, someone asked, what does PRP stand for? It's something called platelet-rich plasma, which is a, um, a, a uh, derivative of our own blood products. And some doctors use those to inject into joints or around tissues around the knee. Um, someone asked, what is force therapy? Uh, force Therapeutics is a video-based, uh, web-based platform to help guide patients through the uh, 
post-operative and perioperative rehab uh, protocol. And there have been a number of studies, including those that we've done at our institution, that have ha found that to be a cost-effective and effective way of allowing patients to do their rehab. Uh, another patient asks whether we use cryotherapy to help reduce swelling after surgery. And basically cryotherapy is, is cold therapy, ice. Um, and we do use uh, cold therapy of some sort. There are different brands out there. Um, and some of us use different brands in the practice, but in general, we do prefer to use a device that helps to, to cool the knee to help reduce pain and swelling after uh, joint replacement surgery. Another patient asks uh, whether knee replacement surgery eliminates any particular type of exercise such as yoga. I assume what you mean is whether you can do all exercises after a total knee replacement. And for many patients, uh, certain activities that require a good deal of kneeling uh, might be a little challenging because as I mentioned, some patients find that kneeling down, doing yoga, um, feels odd because of the numbness around the knee. So patients may choose not to do those exercises or modify how they do them. But we do have a lot of patients actually who not only do yoga, but some patients who teach yoga and Pilates um, after both partial and total knee replacement surgery. Um, patient asks whether they can run after a partial knee or a total knee. And while historically we've always recommended that patients don't run a great deal after uh, partial or total knees, the reality is that these devices nowadays are much more durable than they were 10 and 20 years ago. And all of us have some patients who run two or three miles at a time. They do that two or three times a week. And I think if you run in, with some degree of, of, of uh, moderation, you're probably okay to run. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing a lot of marathon training with knee re replacements uh, because you don't want to you don't want to um, pound these knees down too much. They can uh, wear out in time. And if you're putting too many cycles across the knee, that can be problematic. Um, someone asked, how do you know if robotic surgery is an option? Well, robotic surgery is almost always an option. It really depends on whether your surgeon thinks it's a, an option for you or offers it. Not all surgeons believe in all technologies, and some surgeons don't believe that robotic technology is worth um, the investment. The good news is that the cost to patients, whether you're doing a partial or a total knee replacement with a robot or with conventional techniques, is the same. There's no additional upcharge by the insurance company. So in my perspective, uh, the biggest barriers to the use of robotic surgery is wh whether your particular surgeon believes in the technology and whether the hospital uh, that you're going to offers it. Doctor, are you available for a verbal question? Uh, sure, you can ask a verbal question. Uh, I am in the process of um, having uh, a complete knee replacement through your organization here in the Orlando area in the very near future. And my question to you is, uh, you indicated that uh, as a result of a full knee replacement that the tendons are removed. Uh, what, what are the ligaments rather removed? Uh, what stabilizes the knee at that point if the ligaments are gone? Well, I, I may have misspoken. Um, the, for the most part, the only ligament that we remove in a total knee replacement on a routine basis is the anterior cruciate ligament, although some surgeons offer a newer uh, device, newer technique that spares the, the anterior cruciate ligament. The other one that we may take out on occasion is the posterior cruciate ligament. The knee replacements actually substitute for those ligaments that are removed if they're removed. Primarily, um, though, 
the other ligaments that provide stability to the joint, the medial collateral ligament, the lateral collateral ligament, um, the other tendons around the knee, those are left intact. So there's plenty of stability um, in the knee joint. You don't have to worry about that. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to uh, get both my knees squared away. I'm, a, I'm an 81 year old guy and I still feel I got another 20 years left. So right. I'd like to uh, chase my wife around the house without falling down. That's what I'd like to do. <laughs> good, good luck to you. I'm sure you'll be able to do that afterwards. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for all you do. I really appreciate you and your staff. I really do. Well, thanks for calling in. It's an honor to be able to treat people like you. Uh, God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the last question we'll take here is whether you can get an MRI with a total knee replacement. And that's an important question. Actually, um, there's no harm in getting an MRI um, of any body part uh, with a total knee replacement. The problem is if you need an MRI of the knee, unless you use, unless the radiology department uses special techniques, there's too much artifact uh, and distortion of the images created by the metal within the knee joint. Um, but if you needed to get, if you had a total knee replacement and you needed to get an MRI of your shoulder or your neck or your hip or your ankle or your head, um, it's perfectly safe. You won't damage the knee replacement. Um, that's different than if you have a little metal fragment in your eye or a pacemaker where you have to be more careful about getting MRIs uh, of any sort. So I think at that point, at this point, um, a lot of the questions are, are a little bit redundant, Natalie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anybody has a specific question and, and because we're, you know, getting to the end of our time, um, you can feel free to email me and I can, I can get the answer for you if it's anything specific. Um, you know, I can ask Dr. Lana or one of our other physicians and, and we'd be happy to answer them for you, but we are, it is coming close to seven o'clock. So uh, One quick question. How about an overweight 81-year-old? Is that a candidate? Um, yes. So it depends on, it depends on medical circumstances otherwise and what the other, other medical conditions are that you might have. Um, many times we have an upper limit of one's body mass index, which is the ratio of the height to the weight. And if a patient's body mass index is higher than 40, let's say, we try to get patients on a weight reduction program in order to optimize the circumstances during which surgery is performed to help minimize surgical risk uh, and optimize the outcomes. So um, the biggest factors are what are the medical circumstances? 81 is not an unusual age for a knee replacement. The obesity can be an issue if the body mass index is 40 or higher, um, but that's, that's something that's often uh, manageable with an appropriate supervised weight reduction program. Okay, all well again, thank you all for chiming in tonight. I appreciate you taking an hour of your time. Hopefully you learned something. I always learn something when I have these great conversations with wonderful patients and I appreciate your indulgence. So thank you and have a good night with your families. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Nice night. And thank you, Natalie. Thank you, have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, what